All right, everybody, welcome. Happy Monday. Uh, my name is Jacqueline Rodriguez, and I am the Community Engagement Manager with Toronto Arts Foundation. And, you know, on behalf of all of the staff, we're delighted that you're able to join us today for this webinar. I'll keep my remarks brief as my role here today is really to act as a moderator for our Q&A and to just help troubleshoot any technical issues alongside my colleague Alexandra. As some of you may know, the foundation is hosting this webinar as part of our Creative Champions Network. Ginny Stolk, our network director, uh, will give you a few little bullet points uh, on the program in a few moments for those of you who might be new here or not have heard of it. Um, and with that being said, we have been doing these webinars for about a year now, feels like a lot longer. And while we hope for a smooth session, technical issues can happen. And you know, we're very grateful for your patience as we, we troubleshoot them if they come up. Um, second on my list today is to set the proverbial stage uh, for the webinar. After the introductory remarks, we'll proceed with today's presentation. If you have a question for any of our presenters, please use the Q&A function, not the chat function. We ask this because the chat tends to bury questions and the Q&A keeps them nice and organized. If your question is for a specific presenter, uh, please try and identify them in your question to us. We'll be addressing questions, you know, maybe as they come up, definitely at the end, and we're going to strive to get to as many questions as possible um, by the end of the presentation. Now, while no one has requested ASL interpretation for this session or additional supports, so we are recording today's session. We will make sure uh, we will have the uh, recording and the transcription of the session available as soon as possible following the presentation. With that, I'll turn it over to Ginny Stoke, our Creative Trust Fellow and leader of Creative Champions Network. To you, Ginny. Well, thank you so much, Jacqueline. Um, and thanks as always to you, Jacqueline and Alex for the smooth running of the Creative Champions Network. It's really appreciated. Um, and thanks to everyone for joining us today uh, from locations across the city and beyond. Uh, it's good to know that um, uh, neither snow nor uh, distance are keeping people from uh, joining and participating in the Creative Champions Network. It's the Toronto Arts Foundation's network for arts board members. And we had many um, in-person speaker sessions before COVID arrived. And as Jacqueline mentioned, this is now our seventh uh, network webinar since last March. Um, so that, I think that's enough background on, on the Creative Champions. Uh, you should definitely check out uh, our website at the Toronto Arts Foundation uh, for information on past sessions and for recordings of many of them, uh, and lists of very extensive resources on topics of interest to board members. So our session today, what to do when the shift hits the fan. Um, I don't think there's any need to go into detail about the uncertainties, the disruptions, the changes we've all been dealing with as board members, um, nor about how these changes have been overturning our business models and, and blowing up our standard ways of working. Um, the twin pandemics um, that have hit us over the past year, not just COVID-19, but the recognition and confrontation uh, around structural racism. They've definitely forced a thorough and a necessary um, reconsideration of who we are as a community, who we serve, why we're here and, and how we work. Uh, it's interesting to think about uh, a year back, there were no easy answers for arts organization on how to shift, adjust, pivot, evolve, and ultimately survive COVID-19 lockdowns. Uh, from the start, although there was uh, a tremendous amount of mutual support and sharing within the arts community, the reality was that each organization had to find their own way forward. I've been paying a lot of attention to communications and offerings of the arts organizations I hear from, and there's quite a few that I hear from. And with all sympathy for the tremendous challenges and the differences in capacity that we all have, um, some organizations have very clearly stood out um, in how they've adapted uh, and reshaped how they create, produce, and present their art. 
Uh, I would say that everyone on today's panel is notable for the vigor and the appeal and the surprising power of their responses. I'm happy to say that there are other companies also doing wonderful things that we could have been calling on for this panel, but um, I'm personally fascinated by the very different but similarly inspiring roads chosen by the companies whose leaders you're going to be hearing from today. Before I introduce and call on our speakers, um, I would like to invite uh, us all to join together in acknowledging that the land we're living on is sacred land, that it's been the site of human activity for 15,000 years and the traditional territories of many indigenous peoples. Um, and I invite us all to be mindful uh, that we're only the most recent uh, peoples who've had the responsibility to care for and nurture this land. This year has been offering a great deal of time for reflection. Um, and I think that calls on us not just to honor the wisdom of these first peoples, but to join an act of solidarity with the indigenous women's and men's vital leadership in forging a more equitable future. Uh, where broken promises made to Canada's First Nations will be redressed and where violence aimed at indigenous children, women and men and violence and injustices against all indigenous black and other BIPOC individuals can finally end. That being said, um, I'm going to introduce our panelists for today. I'm not going to repeat uh, their impressive career achievements because they were all detailed in the biographies we sent out, but I will say that we're honored and delighted to welcome Christina Lowen, who is the Executive Director of Opera in Canada, Claudia Moore, who is the Artistic Director, and Christine Moynihan, who is the Board President of New Horse Dance Theatre, uh, Tim Jennings, who is the Executive Director and the CEO of the Shaw Festival, and Arkady Spivak, who is the Artistic Producer of Talk is Free Theatre in Barrie, Ontario. Uh, Arkady, I would like to start with you. Um, could you tell us about the most significant changes and initiatives you've made at Talk is Free in response to the pandemic? And um, would you also just share some of the thinking and analysis that led you to these specific actions, which, you know, I think honestly were sparked by really shocking and um, uh, uh, quick change uh, circumstances that cause us all to sit back and really rethink how to move forward. Of course, thank you, Jeannie, and um, thank you so much for having me, and uh, hello to my fellow uh, nominees or <laughs> presenters. Um, you know, when they first started talking about pivoting, uh, it, was, it was sort of... Uh, a confusing word to me because I felt like we always were, you know, starting a cutting edge theater company in the city that is predominantly associated with sports activity and that kind of stuff. Although there've been great arts groups uh, were pivoting already. And I've also invented social distancing in the theater in the earlier days. So none of it was new developments. Uh, but the words of great uh, Jane Marsland uh, were ringing in my, in, my, in my mind all the time. And she would always talk about stretching your planning horizon. So if today is not what you wanted, or if you cannot fit any, everything that you're looking for into today, all you do is just stretch your planning horizon because nobody said you have to achieve everything in one day, one season, one year, et cetera. And no time was it more appropriate than uh, during the pandemic for a year now. And in stretching the planning horizon, we made a promise uh, that we are not interested in engaging with uh, artists on Zoom beyond workshops, readings, and etc. But what we are wanting to do is build a support system, or take this time to build the support systems that might not be might not have been possible before, and that is both for an audience and for the arts community, the artists. So, uh, for the audience, what we've announced actually one of our latest initiatives were that uh, was that the, for the next three years, our core programming in Barry only will be free of charge to an audience. Uh, so what will happen is folks can book the tickets. They have to give us a credit card if they don't show up or don't cancel 
up to four hours before the performance or exchange, they get penalized $25 per ticket, $15 for students, and that becomes the tax deductible donation. And uh, the decision was both pragmatic and practical, well, pragmatic is practical, pragmatic and altruistic, I should say, was that when we're doing our uh, audit, our ch charity audit last, last year, uh, I looked over the draft statements from our audit firm and I did not see box office anywhere. Now, I should, I should also say that we are doing massive, very large scale programming in 100 seats or even less. Uh, so our organization has been built around, around not relying on a box office figure. Instead, we use the audience as a gateway to other support systems, donors, sponsors, volunteers, board members. Um, it was always slow. Historically, it was always less than 10% of the budget. 10% was like a marvelous year, and that was normal. So, but I couldn't find the box office figure. And so when I phoned them, they said, oh, we have this internal policy. Anything under 3% of the budget gets lumped into miscellaneous. So <laughs> thinking, oh, so my box office does not even get its own item on the financial statement. So I asked them to separate because I have to report an academic and everything. So that made me thinking, I'm like, okay, so there is this giant obstacle uh, to an audience of all kinds and very where we are, of course, is extremely evolving in terms of all sorts of in every consideration. So we're setting up such a giant obstacle over 3% of the budget. So we immediately had a board meeting where we said we're and also I have to raise $1,034 an hour on average in fundraising. I don't have time to, to sell $50 tickets or $30 tickets. So that sort of created a problem. So we had this planning session. And we said, you know, we're probably going to pick lost revenue and in sponsorship supports from the local community because uh, there is now no barrier to an audience. Excuse me, to an audience. I'm getting very excited about uh, to an audience. Um, and um, um, you know, we also did not want to separate it into specific, you know, categories: youth under thirty or single people over sixty or that sort of thing. We we believe that everyone and this is a beauty and power of it everyone has a right to to access we also think that we're going to make more money from people not showing up than those who did but so now i can call anywhere and sell them a ticket they don't have to go anywhere so that's sort of our first initiative done for the artists and here is where uh, here is where i'd like to uh, applaud the show festival in in leadership uh, that Tim, both Tim's uh, took in taking care of the artists where they were uh, very quickly dispensed with across the country um, by protecting them so totally and completely, so Tim. And so I was then thinking, okay, how could I do it on a smaller level? Because we're probably, you know, 60th percent or 60th part, uh, one sixtieth of, of the show festival budget. And, uh, I long ago wanted to try, and that came out of another project and study that we were involved with, which I sort of shelved, that what we were wanting to do is, is create um, almost like a token for an artist than, than any particular income, a three, a, 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 an annual basic guarantee to artists over three years. Uh, what it essentially means is we've promised 39 artists, we're probably going to admit three or between three and six more, a minimum guarantee per year uh, averaging $10,000, some are less, some are more, depending on what it is. What it basically says is you will have contracts for whatever you would choose to do with the degree that you need to do for artistic reasons, personal reasons uh, for, um, for the organization. This could be, it could be acting, it could be directing, it could be personal renewal, it could be anything but you will earn at least this amount or more. So really the way the organization is functioning right now, if you can imagine 401, there is an express lane, there is a collector's lane. Uh, there are 42 people sitting in an express lane, just as many are we're still engaging them on a normal thing. Nobody knows who will get to Ajax first. Uh, you know, those people who are on a, on a, on a guarantee can in fact make less than those people who are not. It all depends on a bunch of things. What we wanted to do more than anything is we wanted to give artists, uh, particularly performing artists, actors in particular, because they're always left behind, um, some hope. And because they, they, they are working in the moment, that's the currency. 
And if the moment is not good, all sorts of existential things start happening. It's not even about money, it's about existentialism. And so that's where this uh, idea came from. And I must say, it's been uh, a full uh, th 360 degree turn in, in their psychics, psychics right now. So that's all I want to say for now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Arkady. And you haven't even mentioned the wonderful programming and discussion panels and things that you've been doing uh, along with all of this. Um, so um, moving on to uh, Tim. Uh, you have gotten, Tim, national coverage for how the Shaw Festival has reshaped itself and praise from Arkady and from me and from lots of people. Um, uh, uh, reshaped itself um, and its relationship to your company artists and I think to your community as well during the pandemic. Could you tell us a little bit about what you've been doing and the thinking behind it? Sure, it, it's, thank you Arkady and thanks for that, that comment Jenny. Um, uh, the Shaw Festival, as you guys probably know, is one of the five largest theater companies in North America, the second largest in Canada and um, and that we, uh, Tim Carroll and I started with the company about five and a half years ago, and we've been leading what we think is a, is a change in the practice and the focus, um, which I, I think Arkady uh, summed up pretty well. It's a philanthropic and altruistic approach. We see ourselves primarily as an arts charity, uh, that art is a charitable endeavor, and that um, the civic theater movement, the not-for-profit theater movement was actually founded uh, at, not as individual organizations, but as a civic movement to improve society, and that our um, namesake, Bernard Shaw, was one of the first people to ever call for that, uh, is, is something that we now see both personally and institutionally as important to us. Um, so, uh, so like I say, we're one of these large theater companies. Our, in a normative year, the Shaw is responsible for about $220 million dollars of the annual economic impact of arts tourism in Ontario. Uh, we're, we're a big engine. We think actually we're the largest uh, individual engine for arts uh, tourism in the, in the uh, province. Uh, our impact is actually larger than Stratford's, who is almost double our size. Um, uh, because people come down and spend weeks with us and, uh, and in a very nice town with very expensive hotels and beautiful restaurants and all sorts of wonderful things. Um, 2019, was the best gross revenue year in our history. Uh, eight days before the pandemic shut us down, we announced a $34 million uh, season the previous year. We had increased attendance to over 325,000 people. Uh, we had, uh, I had inherited a theater company that was the office of the Riccati's. It was 75% uh, earned income when I showed up at the door. And uh, 2019, we had made the stride to increase our uh, philanthropic relationships. So we were only dealing with 65% of our income coming from the box office. Um, only 6% of our income comes from any kind of government source at all. All the arts councils, everything we get every year is less than 6% of our operating, which comparing that to say the opera or the ballet who get in the 30 to 40% range tells you kind of where we are. Um, so uh, who are similarly sized budgets and about 35% of our attendance comes from the United States. So all that for background to give you some information about what we were uh, doing when all of this hit us. Um, eight days after we announced those lovely uh, results, we were suddenly shut down. And so um, the first thing that happened was, was a moment of optimism for the Shaw because in 2015, 16, when I first arrived, my CFO and I went through a process where I asked to review all of our uh, risk areas. And one of those was insurance. And so I took out a pandemic insurance policy that has covered us for most of our losses on this year. Um, that, that insurance policy uh, certainly um, has given us a different kind of optimism than I think a lot of our fellows have gone through. Um, and we realized also that we raise about nine and a half to $10 million a year from private sources. And if we could do that again, we were still one of the largest theater companies in the country, even just on the philanthropic model. So if we could match that um, that insurance payout with, with that uh, investment from our patrons, there was a real opportunity to do something that was going to keep all of our folks employed and go forward. So my board immediately, when I went to them and said, look, we're gonna double down on the idea that we're gonna protect all 550 of our full-time employees and artists, and we're gonna move forward together thinking this will end soon and hopefully we can get back to our stages. Obviously the ending soon part didn't happen, 
but we maintained all 550 people on payroll using what then became the wage subsidy uh, to move us forward um, and underwrite that. So we sort of found all of these different sources and kept everybody going through the summer through Zoom rehearsals and other things. When after six weeks of Zoom rehearsals, it became clear we were going to lose most of the summer. Uh, we, we laid off all of our gig workers, all the contract employees, actors, musicians, uh, designers, choreographers, etc., cetera, um, from their contracts. And two days later, we hired them as temporary summer works employees under a program we called Education and Community Outreach Specialists. So this was a temporary employment position. We laid off 80 artists from their, individual, from their independent contractor work and hired them as employees. So now they were covered by the wage subsidy, what I consistently call the best arts grant in Canadian history. Um, and, uh, and in fact, hired another 15 more than that who were folks who lived in the immediate area and had worked with us either in the past season or were intending to have in the upcoming season. So we ended up with 95 full-time artists working for us doing outreach and education work and creating over 300 separate education and outreach digital content pieces as we moved forward. Um, what's interesting about this, I guess, from a board perspective is the board was really uh, behind us on this 100% for two reasons. One is we'd established this philanthropic relationship to our, to our goals and this relationship to the idea that that what we do was a necessary human need and needed to be fulfilled. And then secondarily, financially, we were in the right position. We'd eliminated over that five-year period before this $10 million of historical debt and deficiencies. Uh, there was a lot going on that, that I think left the boards, and I have four boards unusually, um, feeling like um, uh, the fiscal aspects of the organization were in good shape. So it was really about how did we deal with human management and art. Um, and we continued to do those sorts of things as we, as we had the actors working on all that outreach, our technical staff moved to creating PPE for the Niagara Health System and, and uh, so gowns, hospital gowns for hospices and, and healthcare workers, gloves, masks, all sorts of specialty equipment uh, was donated labor, donated materials. We, had, we went through the process of asking our suppliers to donate cotton, et cetera, to try to help with that process uh, and really doubled down on the civic relationship of the organization to its community. Um, and then I guess um, as that happened, um, we also then used our board as a kind of remarkable sounding board for helping us with modeling and to really dig into their expertises and contacts to be able to think through what the next steps would be. Uh, and through, and, and I have to say through their government contacts to help us figure out how we could move things forward uh, and to gain intelligence that maybe some of our colleagues hadn't been able to access yet. And that's been something we've been sharing as much as we can, but, but it's, it's also left us in good shape so that by September, we were able to start running um, 16 weeks of concerts outdoor originally with our winery partners, hotel partners, all sorts of folks around the area to try to generate economic activity because again, $220 million a year of our economic impact had disappeared from Niagara on the Lake. Thousands of people were out of work because we weren't running. And so it, we felt an immediate responsibility to find a way to underwrite that and, and work with them. I was able to secure a, a partnership with the Federal Development Agency of Southern Ontario, who paid for these free concerts to happen for 16 weeks um, uh, as an economic development agent, not as a um, not as a, uh, an arts grant. This was around economic activity. Um, there's so much more I could talk about, but ultimately this has led us to continue to be optimistic and to try to drive forward um, the kind of idea of, of the, we are a necessary basic human need and without us being on stage, that need is not being fulfilled. So it is the charitable purpose of our work and our mission to be back on stage as soon as possible in a live way. Uh, I guess that's the only other thing I would say is all of this digital activity was not performance. It was all outreach and relationship building. It was not about um, a performative aspect. We think that live performance is an important thing in and of itself, and we doubled down on that. So even if I can only perform for 15 people, that is more important to us than a digital piece from our point of view uh, that, that, that can be solved through other media that are better at it than we are from our, again, from our POV. Um, happy to answer questions after this is all over because we have a lot to talk about and uh, 
feel free, my e email address is timj at uh, shopfest.com. Thank you so much, Tim. Uh, brilliant. Uh, I, I, I've known what you're doing, but to hear it all um, presented at one time is pretty astonishing. The only thing that makes me sad is that I think you're the last company in Canada who's going to be able to afford pandemic insurance. Um, <laughs> well, it, uh, it's not it's not available anymore. No. Uh, not shockingly, um, no. I'm still arguing that it should be covering us for 2021. But uh, okay. but you know, there we are. That'll be my legal battle for the year. Okay. And, um, Let us was, know it, it, In actual fact, dozens of theater companies had some version of this insurance. It's just that we were able to use it differently than most. So right. Okay. Interesting. Um, all right, so let's move on. Uh, Claudia and Christine. Um, Moon Horse uh, is a comparatively smaller uh, dance company, mm -hmm. but it seems to me um, uh, from looking closely at what you've been doing that you've grown much stronger and that you have raised your, um, your impact and your prominence in the community during and possibly as a result of the shutdown. So could you both kind of share, share telling us um, about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'd be very, very happy to. And I thank you for including me in this great discussion. And I, uh, Moon Horse is definitely the little sister here um, in this panel, but I have great admiration for all the work that uh, everyone has done. Um, uh, I'll just give a little bit of background, um, but uh, when the pandemic hit, one of the very first things that I did was to meet up with some of my dance colleagues in the park and dance. We dressed in red, we called ourselves the Red Warrior Women, and we met once a week to, uh, to dance six feet apart. Um, this simple action of solidarity was empowering and became a metaphor, I believe, for all of my future actions. We can move through this pandemic together. I, I believe we're strong, we're creative, we're resilient. We have the tools to face this challenge. They'll close the theaters and the studios, but somehow we're gonna find a way to continue to dance. My company, Moon Horse Dance Theater, as you said, is small and therefore nimble. We have no buildings, few employees. And because our annual event, Older and Reckless, takes place in the fall, we also had the luxury of time to pause and to reflect and to consider our, our plans in the face of COVID. All of my strategic decisions were thoroughly supported by Adina Herling, who is my part-time manager and uh, the Moon Horse Board of Directors, led by Christine Moynihan. Christine has played a major part in Moon Horse's evolution. She was administrator for 10 years while she directed the dance umbrella of Ontario and is now, thankfully, our board chair. Our long relationship and her leadership skills and continued support are really invaluable to Moon Horse and its development. The two most impactful things that we did came from consideration of our senior community. Now, this was easy for us because Moon Horse is concerned with seniors, um, those who are in peril of falling off the edge. It is often the case with our elders and was more pronounced through the lens of the pandemic. We just nearly lost literally a whole generation. The senior community, the artists, and the public are at the heart of Moon Horse activities. And when the shit hit the fan, we realized that we had an opportunity and a great responsibility to make a difference. So the first thing that we did was to shift our classes for seniors online. Um, it sounds simple, uh, but it, it wasn't an easy decision. We had no experience with this, but like many others, uh, we learned on the go. And those classes have been life-saving for the seniors who continue to live in isolation. The online classes also gave us a way to stay connected to the supportive community that makes up a large part of our, of our older and reckless audience. From one of our stellar movers, uh, here's a quote, some of us taking the classes are just loving the opportunity for creative expression and the physical pleasures of dancing a great gift. 
Truly, finding pleasure right now is huge. Dance is empowering in that way, especially in a situation where we have little, little or no control. At least when we dance, we can feel joy and, and feel uh, the sense of power in our individual beings. The second thing that we did was to create an online program in celebration of the 20th anniversary of Older and Reckless. And I wrestled with that. How are we going to do that? You know, we have no experience. Live events, yes. TV shows, no. <laughs> so um, we, uh, you know, uh, Older and Reckless is an annual event that happens at Harbor Front. There's an audience warm up at the beginning. There's a social gathering at the end. So uh, the, the audience has always been at the center of my work as a performer and uh, for the work of Older and Reckless. Uh, I relied mainly on two things uh, to put this program together, instincts and hard work. Two things that are essential to the creative process, funnily enough. Also, I knew what I wasn't interested in. I, I, I wasn't interested in, in live streaming from the theater, uh, but I was uh, interested in dance film and I felt that that genre was very um, appropriate right now. Uh, so we commissioned, um, four dance uh, films um, that were um, made by extraordinary artists um, intended to be seen online. Uh, and um, I also had some good support from a communications expert who was always asking me, asking me the right questions in assembling our online program. Um, the resulting event was revelatory, and some of the dance films have won, won awards due to artistry and invention, not big budgets. We had some wonderful testimonies from artists and from community movers who had performed at Older and Reckless over the years, and uh, we added those in to speak to the value of the series. Our producer, Vicki Fagan, did not have a lot of experience with putting an online program together, but she had the right skills. And she was a terrific collaborator and was willing to work on it with me. What made me most happy about the online event was the strong statement that it made for aging in the arts and for the essential role of the arts in, our li in all our lives. I was happy that it featured the senior artists and the community movers that we cherish and that we were able to employ artists, about 35 of them, to engage in creative pro projects during lock lockdown. Um, it was a difficult process, but we got through it. And it was an honor really to have the challenge. Artists are resilient and we're used to the dark parts and the stress of creative process. We have problem solving skills. You've seen these in action already here from Tim and Arkady. Um, and, um, we have the uh, we get we get a thrill from finding the right ending. So I'm glad for the way it worked out, uh, but I believe we were successful because we were prepared prepared to fail. It was a big experiment. That was our mantra. We decided to go for it, and I'm so glad that we did. <laughs> um, I just want to um, I had to write this down because I knew I would be nervous. Um, there were so many other arts organizations in our position, and I'm in, truly in awe of the many ways that these smaller entities have responded to the challenges of, of the times. Um, we were also grateful for the focus on equity issues and appreciate the time and the collective movement to examine and act on them. Older and Reckless has always upheld an inclusive policy, but we strive to do better and we wish to deepen our relationship with senior artists and of all nations and backgrounds. This is part of our ongoing work and part of our future vision. So despite the hardship and the trauma resulting from the pandemic, I am so grateful for the experience and for the lessons learned. With open hearts, imagination, creativity, and through working together, we can survive just about anything. Thank you. Ah, oh, Claudia. Such beautiful words um, and such beautiful results from uh, um, your thinking and your actions. Um, really great. Christine, am I right in saying that you're going to join us 
for the next. Do you have something right now that you would like to add? A uh, mute. Okay, here we go. Okay. Uh, I, I, let me know how much time I have. Uh, basically, uh, we. I wanted to give Claudia, you know, her uh, her platform because, as a board member, I would love to say that we had done so much, but in fact, all we did was support her. <laughs> you know, and I think it's important for, particularly for small organizations, and we are pretty tiny, frankly, um, to um, to support the artist that you are working with. Uh, because basically they have all the ideas, um, it, which is true. The, 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 the thing as a board member that I would like to say is um, uh, I am interested in how we move forward. That, you know, Moon Horse has always been uh, a small organization. We have a fantastically supportive audience base and a donor base, quite tiny compared to almost everyone else. Um, uh, but what I'm looking at now is how do we uh, move beyond our geographic area and what are the things that we have learned from the pandemic and from being online and from doing all the things that Claudia has uh, has created in terms of uh, how do we go, how do we go forward. Um, and I think there's some really interesting stuff that we can look at in terms of um, we can't necessarily tour, but how do we reach out to other communities? How do we involve people from other places? If I can, just because you know some of the things that the, the people have been talking about were really interesting, because we're small and we don't have we have a, a very supportive board, uh, and we you know we try to work hard to you know support the organization, but we don't have we don't have the ear or you know the the, um, uh, the the ability to reach out to some of the movers and shakers in the government. So I'm really interested in what Tim had said about things like. Uh, an arts charity, because at the moment, from my understanding, the creation of art is not a charitable activity. It is around education. I mean, yes, you know, and we can, we can, but there, there are other things around that. And so I'm, I'm interested in how the smaller organizations can work with, help, support, and be in congruence with a different idea of how we approach governments about this of how we approach organizations like this. We, we'll never have the people who can pick up a phone and talk to you know, Justin or whoever, that's never gonna happen for us. But we have some ideas and some abilities to, um, to provide information and uh, that sort of thing. Um, uh, yeah, so, so, so the, 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 you know, the, the, the whole idea of a charitable purpose is a, a very interesting, a lot of interest to me. Also the idea of does everyone need to be a charity? Can we have a different way of functioning um, in the world that you know will will mean we need to uh, you know talk to people at CRA and, uh, and that sort of thing. So that's um, and the other thing I think I will just end with this because uh, I love it is that failure is always an option and it's not a bad thing, and that every board member needs to be supportive of that and their, um, the, the people that they're supporting as board members. They do indeed. Thank you for all those um, uh, really good questions about future action and, and future collaborative action for the community as a whole. I hope we can get back to some of those at the uh, end of this discussion once we hear from uh, Christina Lowen. Uh, uh, and thank you for all of your comments. Christina, um, you are running an art service organization. Um, and I know that uh, Opera CA or now Opera in Canada has been looking for national sector-wide new ways of working now that everything is virtual by necessity. Um, now you've been mm -hmm. a national arts organization, so you probably were pretty used to a lot of virtual um, already. Could you please tell us about some of the, a few of the uh, major initiatives that you've launched um, that have been, uh, that have come about during mm -hmm. the pandemic and the lockdowns? Yes, um, I'd be delighted to, and thank you so much for inviting me here to speak. 
Um, the pandemic, had, it's really been catastrophic for the opera sector, but especially for opera artists. And this is actually where we focused our, our strongest response as we consider them to be our sector's essential workers. Um, as some of my uh, panelists, colleagues have mentioned already, this has also been a time of, also a time of great opportunity um, and renewal and even regeneration. And it's hard to see that because we're still in the middle of it and we're in this world of rapid responses and short runways. Everybody's under a lot of stress. There's incredibly heavy workloads and there's, there's it's, sometimes it just seems like there's not a moment to catch our breath. Um, I wanted to just provide a bit of contextual information about Association for Opera in Canada. We're a small national arts service organization. We have a budget of, or we had a budget of just under $300,000 going into the pandemic with one full-time staff member and a number of outsourced contracts. And our board is mainly comprised of general directors or representatives of our member opera companies. So thinking back to a year ago, almost to the day, um, just some of the things that happened in chronological order, because it's just been um, an incredible time for, uh, for action. We, around this time, we were notified that we got a half million dollar digital strategy grant, and a week later, the world went into lockdown. We struck a $40,000 Opera Artists Emergency Relief Fund to help artists meet basic needs. This was before the CERB benefits began to flow. We added a new member category for artists and more importantly, or just as important, new programs to serve their needs. We offer membership dues relief to anyone who needs it. So if you can't pay your dues, but you need services, um, we're there for you. Uh, and we also spent our spare time rebranding, building a new website and even celebrated our 20th anniversary. <laughs> so I wanted to talk about two of the things we did that involved a different way of thinking. So starting with our digital strategy grant, we had recently announced the Opera Civic Impact Framework. And this was a, our way of telling a collective story of the impact opera has in its communities across the country through the work of its civic activities. The digital grant was to turn it into a tool to simplify data collection and reporting through a digital platform. And we got the grant on March 2nd, and then we all know what happened 10 days later on March 12th. Um, so it was a moment of wonderful celebration followed by um, just terrible, terrible sadness and not knowing what to do. And we really took our time. We, we had something like three or four months to accept the grant. And I think we took every single day of that time. Um, and we wanted to deliberate, like very carefully deliberate whether or not we should even accept this grant. Um, the sector was closed. They weren't even producing opera, let alone um, civic impact communities and community events. But this was also the culmination of a five year strategic arc. And we really felt strongly that we needed to see it through. And so we decided that if we were going to accept the grant, that it needed to be revised to reflect the new reality and the re you know, this new COVID-19 reality that we were only starting to um, understand at the time. And the shift that we made was um, ultimately in adding to the scope of the grant. We decided to add two additional COVID response frameworks. The, the first one was a recovery framework, which would track how the sector is doing against other industry aggregate data. And it would work by pulling in data from Stats Canada and comparing it with um, performing arts uh, data um, against these larger industry aggregates. And in that way, we'll, paint a very clear picture of how our sector is recovering or lagging behind um, national numbers. And we thought this would be very important for advocacy as the sector started to recover. And then the second framework we added is the resilience framework. And the resilience framework would be used to measure the progress of our new intentions as a sector. These intentions were not to return to normal when we reopen because we recognize that normal actually wasn't so great um, and that we all had uh, a collective need and desire and imperative to build back better during the reopening phase and we had to make changes to become this better sector this more equitable sustainable inclusive and resilient sector and the resilience framework would be the way that we would measure our progress in that way we pitched the idea to the board and then to the members we got the buy-in we needed and we accepted the grant a little over three months later. 
And we've currently built out the Civic Impact Tool, the digital tool, and the recovery dashboard, and we're in the process of building the resilience framework. Um, Important to note that we have plans to scale this entire project beyond the opera sector to the broader arts community, and we'll be doing that in partnership with Mass Culture. So stay tuned for more information there. Um, you know, what was different in, in our thinking? I, I would say that, you know, um, you know, we've heard about instincts and we've heard about hard work. I also want to add courage. So this was very early in the pandemic, and it was a bit early to stand out there and say, you know what, we can't go back to normal. Normal wasn't good. We've got some problems. We have to fix this. We have to do better. Um, I'm not going to. I'm not going to lie. It was tough, and it was pretty scary. Um, and I was really afraid that it would be seen as, you know, a bit of overkill or perhaps a bit heavy-handed. Um, but very rapidly after my presentation to the board and to the members. We had the murder of George Floyd. We had the rise of Black Lives Matter. And everyone really sat up straight and realized that that time for action was now. The other thing I wanted to talk about really quickly, it's very similar to uh, Tim's, Tim's uh, project, is the Portfolio Artist Collective. In June, so th three, four months into the pandemic, I was hiring a full-time position. It was our first one, actually, very exciting. But the search just wasn't working out. I wasn't finding what I was looking for. But along the way, I was finding really interesting people. And I was also finding a lot of out of work artists uh, with diverse and interesting skill sets. And I just couldn't get this idea out of my head that I was trying to solve a new world problem with an old world solution. And so I took a leap of faith. There's that courage again. And instead of hiring one person, I hired seven. Uh, they worked for eight weeks. They were all on different size contracts doing different jobs and they were all, it was almost entirely paid for by the, uh, the wage subsidy program. The team worked remotely from cities across Canada. We had um, members in Toronto, Montreal and Kelowna and they, uh, the first activity they did was to name themselves. So they called themselves the Portfolio Artists, uh, Portfolio Artists Collective. Uh, it was a small scale experiment. I would say that it worked. I got the help I needed. One of the team wrote a successful grant for $48,000. Five out of seven found employment afterwards. Um, and it was a learning experience for all. Um, and now it's a, we're looking at it um, to be a, a model for a multi-year sector initiative project that we can possibly scale up um, with funding from uh, ESDC's sector initiatives program. And it's our hope that Companies uh, all across the country, opera companies will will host their own artist collective and provide uh, skills development opportunities that will help artists better position themselves for adjacent opportunities until they can return to live singing. So that's uh, oh, so what was different about the collective in terms of the thinking? It it's experimental, right? It's like I thought what was really nice about it was that I, I you know I didn't have to make a forever decision. I could make an eight week decision. Um, I could see a problem. I could come up with an experiment and I could test the ways to address it. Um, and, and I could monitor the success of that. And it could be a failure and it could be a success, but no matter which one it is, there's always going to be learning. Um, and it, this, there's just no better time. There's no better time to experiment these days because there's just, there are so few barriers and resistance to change and there are a lot of safety nets in the form of government subsidies. So I would just say be bold and try something new. Oh my goodness, thank you so much, Christina. Um, and thank you everybody. You know, when I first chose uh, this group of people, I knew everybody was doing good things and I was pretty sure that they were all thinking and planning in very um, uh, smart ways. Um, but I had no idea really that the themes would be so consistent. Um, Jacqueline, you're there because we've got some questions, but I just want to, um, I just want to, people have talked about their boards and it, um, you've talked about your boards because your boards appear to have been there for you and behind you and supportive of what you did, which I think is probably a large part of why your organizations responded so very um, actively and positively. Um, it, I don't know that that's true of every board uh, in the arts or in the arts world, um, 
you know, I was part of, you know, many of us uh, uh, knew about the Leadership Emergency Arts Network Green that brought together advisors, you know, senior people from the arts community with companies that were having problems um, and needed advice. Um, and uh, before companies signed up, they were talking about their issues and their problems that they needed help with as involving finance, programming, scenario planning, donor relations, and boards. But in the final reports uh, of this um, initiative that lasted for six months, um, the number one thing that was mentioned more often than anything else was concerns about boards of directors. That's what they really, really wound up talking to their advisors about. Um, do we have any further additional thoughts about that, um, about that role of boards and about what we have wanted and needed from our boards, especially during a time of, uh, you know, great uncertainty, but presumably um, into the future. Yes, Tim. Sure, so I mean, I think one of the things we've spent the last five and a bit years doing is reorienting our boards to a kind of a more risk-centric uh, framework and thinking about risk differently, that, that, that there are all sorts of measures of success and failure in everything, um, financial being one of them, of course, but it's only one of them, and especially from the point of view of if, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm a big believer that the arts is actually a core charitable activity, and it always has been. Uh, the, 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 the act that defined charity originally in 1603 by Queen Elizabeth names art as one of the things that we're responsible to do. It's one of the five things named, so I feel like it's always been there, but sometimes we drift away from that. Um, I, I, I think in our own space to remind people that that is what we're here for, that we all serve these basic human needs is, is something that I think helps a board recognize us in the same way they would, that you wouldn't back away from your need to, re, to deliver a program at a homeless shelter or a library or a hospital or, or, or frankly, any other kind of civic institution, public education, et cetera. All of these things come from the same impetus. So there's a, there's a need there to remind people that, that uh, good financial management is table stakes. We actually should all do that, that, that and, and that good financial management does not mean no deficit. Sometimes investment beyond our, our annual number is in fact important to a long-term goal. So these things are, are around conversations and, and, and I think a long-term education strategy with, with boards. Um, we spend a lot of our board meetings talking through a process of, of educating people on our on our art form, but also on our whole business, and I do a um, uh, monthly or more than monthly um, update and situational piece out that's probably you know five to hundred to a thousand words a month on on us and where we are and kind of educating people on the things we should be looking at and talking about and asking the board's direct opinion for you know, and, and expertise for these things. Um, I guess that's the only other thing I would say is, and that we've hired our board members for their expertises and their constituent understandings is a big thing, that we're not just hiring them because they have money, that that's not actually why I want a board member. I can get a donor to give me money, and I know that varies by scale of organization, but I've run very small organizations and seemingly running a medium-sized one now. But the, but the, the framework of that is, um, you know, is not about why you have board members. Board members are there when a fiduciary relationship, but they're also there as your best cheerleaders. And so how do they balance those things out? Okay, I now promise that we will do a session in the near future about this whole topic of reimagining governance because um, it, it somehow, you know, in my mind anyway, runs through everything we do at Creative Champions. Everything we do at Creative Champions is about educating boards and coming to common understandings of what boards should be doing and how they should be doing it in order to have positive results um, on their organizations and on their communities. But I think we need to dive deeper into that. And now Jacqueline is waving frantically at me because we've got a lot of questions and we want to get to some of them. Um, uh, before we have to close this really wonderful session. Jacqueline, tell Great. us. Great. Great. So one of our questions here, and any panelists can respond, uh, is there any area where your boards might have supported the pandemic programming and approach where they didn't? Or could they, where could they have been more supportive, more understanding?
Not these lucky people, eh? <laughs> Resounding support. Uh -huh. I, I think we found from the lean responses that there were instances in our community where that was very much the case. I, I don't know what the details were precisely. Great, then we'll just move right on. <laughs> okay, our second question. Um, did you feel that you had adequate information, science-based, about COVID specific for the performing arts? Uh, transmission risk, depending on the type of arts, dance, opera. If so, which resources and sources did you rely on? Interesting. Um, I, the ones I can give you quickly that you should reference, um, uh, the McKinsey Company does a regular update on pandemic response and modeling. They're the folks that the Public Health Canada and uh, more specifically the CDC in the States use as their modeling organization. Uh, the New York Times does an, a daily update on vaccine preparation internationally. They're a very useful framework. Uh, I read The Lancet twice a week probably, which is a medical publication um, that, uh, uh, I may have read more now than most doctors do. Um, it's a, it's a, but, but again, we were grabbing at every possible. I mean, my, my, I see my job primarily as having been the guy who became the expert on modeling for this stuff. So it's um, uh, sources were widely varied. Um, we also were talking directly to, um, to uh, direct sources here in Canada. I hired a board member on. Glenn Bandiera, who's the director of research for the University of Toronto and director of emergency medicine for St. Michael's Hospital. It's also the chair of the National Medical Association. So it, he had a lot of access that we used. And again, hire for expertise and hire for connection. Right. And, and Christine has pointed out that the film uh, and TV industry, which has generally speaking, found ways to continue filming, um, uh, whereas we haven't all found <laughs> practically none of us have found ways to get people back into theaters but we'll have to do that really soon so thank you Tim for those um, suggestions and we'll we'll have to as a community begin sharing all of this information. Jacqueline what's next? Okay for Arkady what were the conversations with your board members in order to support artists basic income as a model moving forward and how does this impact your relationship with your artists? Uh, very good question. They were completely on from the beginning unanimously financially, believe it or not, for the because we're committing to a three year figure. Uh, what we wanted, what they wanted to look at is whether it was upsetting any employee employer relationship and an employment act, which uh, Derek Chua came in and very quickly sorted everyone um, out. Derek and Chua, the entertainment lawyer within the theater world, thank you. That's right, uh, sorry about that. Um, and um, yeah, so they were, they were instantly on board. Uh, they understood that it takes, uh, that it was a risky thing, but that's a risk they were prepared to take and the organization can afford to. Uh, what it changes with the artists is an even uh, more, uh, more interesting question to me. And that is a significant paradigm shift. It's no longer about uh, that artist securing their value to get a gig it's about them feeling supported to make a, to have an opinion and bring a point of view to the work including the clay contract that i want to be doing and still and not being financially persecuted for it so it's uh, it completely changes the paradigm and supports them because it's one thing for me to say you know your choice wasn't daring enough you kind of stopped halfway well who's going to protect them if it doesn't work out so the point here is they can mess up for the next three years. And as long as something comes out of it, we're good, you know, uh, financially. So that changed quite a bit. Also what changed is because our tickets are free. We don't have to announce anything till it's ready for public. So I don't have to commit to a brochure and then hope it's going to work out. You know, I can literally announce we are now going, we're doing away with the traditional season. We're just going to announce two months at a time based on what's ready, based on when people are available and Tim's don't want them, those kind of things, you know? That's a different business model. That's a yeah. different model. It's really very good. Okay, Jacqueline, one or two more, one, one. Let's do one more, just okay. since we are one minute past the hour here. Uh, so <laughs> lastly, can any of the panelists comment on any reluctance that their artists might have experienced in shifting from live to digital performances? and how the artists were encouraged and supported to make the shift universally successful. 
I think it's total nonsense. Nobody liked it. Yeah, I, I, don't I agree. We were sort of in the same. I mean, we think it's with a remarkably successful outreach activity. It is a terrible medium for delivering live performance from our POV. Yeah, so we did talk talks and discussions and internal play readings, those kind of things, but never for an audience. Christine, yeah. I mean, uh, okay, uh, but I'm interested, Claudia, in, in how particularly, you know, Denise and William Young felt uh, their, 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 the piece that they did for Older and Reckless has been highly lauded. It's won, you know, uh, uh, awards and that sort of thing. So how did they feel about doing that as opposed to live? I mean, we all want live because it's a thing, but can you talk a little bit about that? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, the thing about the the dance film uh, genre is that it's it's a completely different medium. It's not we're not trying to replace live performance. In fact, uh, I, I am I'm a diehard live performer, and and that's why I was not keen on the live stream from the theater because I, if if you're going to be seeing a production that's on stage, you go to the stage. Um, but but dance film, short uh, dance films, which are a different creative um, uh, challenge and uh, have a specific goal to be seen uh, online and on screen, that, that became a, a completely different issue. And it was, <clears throat> I think the artists were really excited about that challenge. Yeah, agreed. Um, although I will say that Crystal Pike's um, uh, 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 screening of her performance at the pa Paris Opera Ballet, still on for a few days, is fabulously wonderful. But I uh, completely agree with everybody's feeling that there, that live is something so special and so important to our hearts and souls and to our feeling of community that, um, that uh, uh, you know, sitting in front of the screen does not make up for that. Well, I see that not only is our time um, a little bit over, but there are a few people who've had to leave who, who came to us. And I would like to just take the remaining minute to say thank you so much to everybody. This was an amazingly interesting and rich discussion and I'm grateful for everybody. And to those who've logged in and tuned in, um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it inspired some thoughts and some perspectives and some ideas about how to uh, continue to confront and create your future. Um, and uh, just to say that if you'd like to hear more from the Creative Champions Network, um, uh, information aimed at arts board members, please do fill in your evaluation forms um, uh, so that we can hear from you and we can deliver the information and the inspiration you need on the topics that you're most interested in and concerned about um, these days and into the future. Um, so many thanks, gratitude, um, and I guess we're signing off now. Bye-bye. <laughs>